Over to you, Shashank. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Deepu to everyone right now. And uh, I guess the first time I met Deepu was in 2006 in Survani Hill Survey, which is a small, uh, high elevation Shola forest in uh, just north of Palkad Gap. And uh, we had like some fantastic birding, uh, especially looking for Western Guard high elevation endemics. And over the year, we did lots of birding together um, in Bangalore and other areas as well. But um, in fact, uh, it's and it's perfect for this talk that uh, we made probably the first ever dedicated pelagic trip from, from India in uh, September 2010, I guess. And uh, I'm sure Deepu will have a lot to talk about that and some funny incidences. And uh, we all have a lot to learn from him. Uh, when it comes to pelagic birding, I don't think uh, anyone can uh, come close to in Deepu in, in, within Indian limits. And uh, over to you, Deepu. Yeah, thanks, Shashank. So let me share my screen. Give me a minute. So I hope the slides are visible. Okay, then we'll start. Okay, a very good evening to everyone. And welcome to this talk on pelagic birding experience in India. So I'm not going to talk much about pelagic birds in this session, but the idea is to talk about the experience. And it's uh, somewhat similar to other birding experience, but has its own unique charm. Before going to the pelagic part, I just want to start with whatever is happening here. It has been wonderful to follow the Delhi bird webinar series and I have enjoyed every one of them. For example, a few weeks before we had Bikram section session on rare birds and the experience of searching for them was really amazing. Similarly, Shashank also gave a session on his experiences of birding. But I think all these presenters conveniently left one group of birds, that is the pelagic birds. And thanks to that, we have this session today. And this is one of that, those set of birds which generally people skip even in a field guide. When you have a plate of uh, pelagic birds, most of the people do not even take, give attention to that. For them, it is a set of birds which they're not going to see forever in their life. So I also thought the same till actually the pelagic started. So that is a uh, uh, backdrop. And one other thing I just want to touch upon is that some of the previous talks mentioned about the issues around current day bird watching and photography. Some of the things were positive and there were also some negative opinions about bird photography, photographers, intrusive birding, etc. But when we come to pelagic, the picture is a little bit different. As we will see, there is a unique aspect to pelagic and in pelagic scenario, I can tell without any doubts that digital photography has played a significant role in identification of many pelagic birds. And it also has helped immensely to make these trips popular and hence viable because we need to hire a boat and go for these pelagic trips. And we need a minimum number to do that. And the great images that has come out of the pelagic trips has encouraged many people to come forward and organize a trip. So thanks to all those photographers and birders who made this happen. Now that I have praised these photographers enough, I'm sure that none of those photographers will mind me using their pictures in this presentation without even asking them. So hope I'm good there. So let's start. So what is pelagic birding? For a casual birder, uh, the term pelagic birding means going out into the sea or a ship in a ship or a boat sufficiently far from land that they feel it is different. For example, a casual boat ride along the beach to view a sunset or a boat trip to a nearby island doesn't count as pelagic. It needs to be a little bit more adventurous. It should be something like this, where the land is far away and the sunset and sunrise 
is magical or it could also be like this where one is surrounded by a flock of rare birds which he or she would not have expected to see in his or her life that's true that is when you really feel that you have done a pelagic now before 2010 we did not have such organized trips where birders are taken into the sea far away from the land and we search for birds but in 2010 we had a set of crazy birders who had this idea of hiring a fishing boat and going into the sea and trying to see if there are any birds out there so we also uh, had uh, some uh, backup or support from Department of Fisheries and Coastal Police, etc., and of in Kerala uh, from Kannur, and then finally it got materialized as Shashank mentioned in September 2010. And these uh, images, for example, are from those tr that trip where we could actually go out into the sea and see some wonderful pelagic birds. So before these pelagic trips happened, most of the uh, ornithological information about pelagic birds came from uh, one-off trips or few records from sea watching like, like those from Heinz Lehner from Goa or observations from ships uh, or windblown birds etc. But once this pelagic uh, happened in 2010 September a lot of people got interested and then there was a series of pelagic trips that happened from various places in the west coast and the east coast of India and this these trips actually gave us the real information about our of our about our pelagic birds and now that information is available uh, and it is actually interesting to see that some of the trends that we thought earlier were, were was not really the one and we have a completely a slightly different understanding of how these birds are distributed. Okay, so now what was this uh, pelagic uh, experience or how is a pelagic experience? So typically, you, if you search in web for a pelagic birding trip, you generally get some amazing images, uh, images and you will see, wow, this is uh, amazing. This is a great way to watch birds. For example, you may hit some famous pelagic tour images from New Zealand or Australia or US where these uh, pelagic trips are uh, regular uh, occurring. For example, take this uh, image from New Zealand Kaikoura. Uh, they do pelagic trips to uh, watch the albatrosses and other birds. And this is how it looks like. There are albatrosses, there are northern giant petrels, there are cape petrels, all at a mobile click distance. So see, the, see how that person is photographing. And when you see such images, you will, uh, you will you will be really like uh, excited to go for uh, pelagic. Okay, so now, but uh, so what is happening? Uh, let's uh, get back home and see how it happens in India. So how did we start? How was our first uh, pelagic trip? Uh, so in India, it looks like this. Okay, so this was from our first pelagic trip. So now you can really see how this uh, happens in India. You are in the middle of a vast ocean. No birds anywhere in the vicinity. Weather is hot and humid, and most participants are already drained out. So you can see some of uh, uh, the participants here in this image. And if you're lucky, there'll be one or two who will be awake and will be keeping a watch for that one bird which may appear for a few seconds among the waves and quickly disappear. So these watchers or bird watchers actually will shout that there is a bird and then all these people will suddenly spring to life and then uh, try to see that bird. So that is what the reality that we saw uh, saw when we started this uh, pelagic. But it is not always that bad. Let's compare this to a safari, for example. Here you, in a safari, typically you keep scanning the forest in a small jeep for the elusive tiger or a, a special bird like an owl or a raptor. The vehicle may be cramped and you cannot move around much. There are a lot of people in front of you you cannot see sometimes. And compared to that, look at the board on the right side. You have a bigger boat with railings to keep you safe. You have more space, you can walk around, stretch your legs or even lie down. 
and when a bird appears you have less heads which block your view so it's not that bad and things sometimes can better too so it's not always that bad and things can be better like this yes this looks different right so here it is a luxurious boat and you have chairs and you have sofas you have pillows amazing so this is one trip that happened uh, from mangalore shiva organized this trip and it is it is a luxurious trip compared to the previous one that we uh, saw in the last slide and i will take a pause here and let you look at those people who are there so there are some uh, famous uh, faces uh, popular in the bird watching circle and i am sure few of them are familiar to the delhi birders and others here as well so all this is amazing you have a great boat you have all the facilities and it uh, looks good but then the villain strikes so no one can predict who will fall to this villain but if you are hit then you really need those sofas and pillows the only way you can stay sane is to lie down otherwise you will be puking even when your stomach is empty so you will continuously be puking so for example in this particular trip a couple of famous photographers so i won't say their names so it is for you to guess and if you look carefully in the slides you will know who i'm talking about but i won't say their names a few of these famous photographers barely got up after we left the harbor and they were just using those pillows and sofa and just lying down after few rounds of puking they were really tired and they could not get up but when someone calls out something like hey there's a school at 3 o'clock these people would jump out of their bed with their cameras like pouncing tigers or tigresses and burst a series of shots before the bird is even out of sight both of them or uh, both of them would be back in their den relaxing as if nothing had happened okay and then at the end of the trip this is what the result is so these are shots from a person who got hit by the villain and look at the shots perfect shots fully focused and if you take a full frame shot the bird is in the center of the frame you won't believe that these people were lying down and were struck by the villain so once uh, the trip is over when everybody is sharing their images the guys who were standing would have got a lot of bl blurred shots and these so called sick people would have got much better shots so the villain is not that harmful for at least some so talking about photography what are those uh, some unique things in a pelagic trip that is appealing to a photographer so typically a photographer wish uh, wishes for great perches great background and a 360 degree approach so that he can take the bird in the angle that he wants and look at pelagic it offers the perfect blend of this so you always or almost always or a, a good percentage of time you will see a bird in its natural perch in this case they will be swimming if they are resting and sometimes for a change you can also get an artificial perch like this so this is something that we have made for them and then there is also this may you if you ha hate artificial perches then you can get this man made natural perch for example like this banana plant plantain uh, stuff so here you can see how nicely it blends with the the water so if you look at the background again you see in all these images you get that perfect clutter free nice background and the color of the background changes to green to blue to a gray so it is always changing and while the waves are moving the birds sometimes are coming with a background of the sea and at other point of time they will be on top of the wave giving you a nice blue sky as your background so then this background keeps changing so from a photography point of view it's really interesting and it's very different from the way you photograph a bird on land and not just that since these birds are resting in the sea and they have not really interacted much with humans they don't know that we are really that bad right so you can actually move around your subject so you take your boat you circle around a bird and find the best angle that you 
want find the best angle with a good light and then you shoot the bird so that's uh, that's another unique thing about pelagic uh, bird photography so most of the photographers who have come for a pelagic trip have returned with amazing photographs great uh, great uh, angles great uh, uh, birds uh, though they have to struggle with their equipment on a moving boat a rocking boat and they are worried about salt water etc but the images that come out are really worth so this looks a little bit tough right so you have a moving boat then you have this uh, uh, villain which is uh, puking the problem of seasickness so what do what do we do is there an easy way of course there is an easy way but it comes with a very big catch for example these are the images that came in facebook recently uh, all these are uh, from kolkata city and surroundings this happened during the recent cyclone though it's an unfortunate event for pelagic birders it uh, it was like a like a dream come true many of these birds which you cannot really normally see uh, from the land or even the shore came into the land because of the cyclone and these birds were flying around so you could get short tail shearwaters in the backdrop of your garden or your area you could get sooty turns against your house and your bridal turn is uh, has a background of your garbage dump so this can happen but this is also not a good time for a bird photographer or bird watcher to go out so unfortunately though it's an easy way it's not really the best way so what is the best way so how to see them the best way for uh, a person actually uh, to see a pelagic bird would be something like this so you should get a bird in your balcony so this happens a lot with pelagic birds because uh, they get caught in the cyclonic winds or monsoon winds so it's not just uh, an occasional cyclone that causes this a lot of times the regular monsoon winds also bring these birds into land and they then uh, get locked in the land and uh, they will be tired because of the uh, wind and the ordeal that they have uh, they went through so they need uh, some support so if you take care of them for a few days they will recover back and then they can be released for example this is uh, a mass booby which is generally uh, a rare bird is seen sitting on the balcony of uh, a fellow pelagic birder pp srinivasan so he had this booby in his uh, house for few days and once this photo shoot was over this model flew away happily back knowing that one day it will become famous all over india and that day is today so now this bird is a famous bird and this is uh, this is the best way but this is only for those uh, few lucky people who are staying near the coast where you can get a pelagic bird like this for others uh, you have to check out the coast on a windy day so this is one uh, time for during monsoon time if you are along the western coast and during the northeast monsoon on the eastern coast sometimes you have a chance to see some of these pelagic birds flying or maybe slightly uh, Uh, coming slightly near to the land and other possibilities are if you are uh, taking a, sh a trip on a ship or a research vessel or a patrolling vessel or a fishing boat uh, there is a good chance of seeing a pelagic bird and sometimes very rarely if you are really lucky you can also see some birds uh, from the shore so some of these birds like uh, terns or uh, skuas they can come near to the shore and sometimes they also rest on sandbars which are along the coast so that is uh, a pure luck and the other or the best way the other best way to actually see a bird especially if you really want to photograph it is uh, the set of organized pelagic trips that has been happening uh, from 2010 so in these trips you have the advantage that uh, we go for such uh, for the birds so we are searching for them and when we see a bird we decide that how much time to spend with that bird and what to do how much uh, 
uh, how long we want to stay out, etc. So in other cases, you may not have that flexibility, but in this pelagic trips, actually, you have that choice. Okay, so now we have seen uh, uh, how a pelagic trip is happening. Uh, we just saw that uh, some of the images from some pelagic trips, but what do you get out of this uh, pelagic uh, trips? So normally, you always say that the catches from a pelagic trips are price catches. So typical price catches in all pelagic trips are like this, or like this. So every pelagic trip, we see a quite a good number of uh, fishing boats and their catch is amazing. So before we even look at the birds, these are the things that we, we enjoy. So you can see a variety of fishes and other uh, creatures that is there in this catch. And here you have a nice fish that is uh, in the hook. And uh, it is not that the uh, boat that we are traveling is catching this. Sometimes that does, ha that, uh, does happen. But occasionally there will be another boat which is just, uh, which has just finished their uh, ca catching and they may be returning and that is the time when we meet them. And then there is a bargain that happens between the boats. So what we will say, we need fresh fish. Will you be able to give us? And they will say, what do you have? So sometimes it's very interesting uh, to see the price of uh, uh, these price catches. So in one trip, actually what uh, we had with us was this uh, banana and the other boat was having fishermen who had left their home a week before or something. So we bargained and finally managed to give our banana uh, in return for the fresh uh, fishes. So it's uh, sometimes it's very interesting uh, to uh, see these bargains and get the new, the fresh catch that you got from the sea. Okay, let's uh, now go into the birds. So what are the common birds that we see in a pelagic trip? So of course, if you are really asking what are the common birds, these would be a few good examples. So we see a lot of waders, uh, kite, brahmini kites, herons, phalaropes, gulls and terns, and many other trips also will give you white-bellied seagull, egrets, swallows, swifts, pipits, etc. So all these are birds which we have seen in pelagic trips. And I'm sure these are common birds. And these are the birds that we see not just along the coast, but a few kilometers into the sea. So most of the shots are from inside the sea, not from the coast. And some of these birds are interesting as, uh, as you see here. So we have swifts, uh, plenty of barn, uh, uh, swallows, etc., flying around. We have seen them. And sometimes a very uh, interesting swift, like a common swift has been uh, recorded in uh, during this uh, pelagics. And even once the pipit actually landed on the boat and took rest for some time and then continued its journey. And if you look at one of these pictures here, this herons, that actually is, uh, it's, is even more intriguing. So this uh, a flock of herons uh, were seen around 30 to 40 kilometers uh, away from Govan coast. And they were actually coming from the west direction. So if you really think, it may be possibly coming from, some, from Africa, because if you are looking from towards the west at 30, 40 kilometers from Goa, the direction that you get is that uh, Africa. So, but we don't know. So these birds were coming from that direction towards land. And uh, they just, uh, they, they didn't really seem like uh, disturbed birds or windblown birds. They were just flying naturally and then uh, passed us and went towards the land. So it's interesting to see that some of these birds are having such movements. And it shows that there is a lot to learn and we still don't know many of the mysteries uh, of what uh, even our common birds like these uh, have. So, okay, so, so these are the common uh, land birds that we have seen in pelagics. So what about the real pelagic birds? So, so that'll be, that is a key question, right? So let's get into that. So now we come to the real price catches in a pelagic trip. So the first group of birds that 
we have seen in, a, in pelagics and this is a this is a group which has been which is represented by a lot a good number of species is uh, shear waters so we have uh, five species of uh, shear waters recorded uh, in pelagic trips the first one uh, the first image here is uh, flesh footed shear water so this image is again from the first trip in uh, 2010 by Raju and it is one of the greatest image one of the best image of uh, flesh footed shear water and you can see the bird shearing the water with the tip of its wing and making that name shear water so come alive in this photo and it, this photo has generated so much of interest after that uh, 2010 pelagic trip that many people wanted to do a pelagic immediately after that and to tell you this flesh footed shear water is the commonest shear water that we have encountered in Indian coast and it's quite uh, uh, frequently seen uh, during the monsoon time. On, on the next bird which is the black and white bird on the right of flesh footed shear water is uh, Persian shear water. So this was the second shear water that we recorded and in, this was recorded in a 2011 trip and this trip was a three day trip actually it was a pretty long trip so people travel from bangalore to mangalore we had a day of pelagic there and then from there we moved to kannur in kerala there we had two days of pelagic and this is a trip where we saw this uh, so first saw this uh, flesh footed shear water the bird in inset inset is uh, she was image of flesh footed shear water from the uh, first day of that trip and i think that is the uh, first uh, image that we have in field of this bird and then in the next two days, we saw a few flocks of uh, uh, Persian uh, shear water, sorry, not flesh footed, Persian shear waters. Uh, so that was a great experience. And these two are the common shear waters that we have seen in pelagic trips. And then we have uh, three other not so common shear waters. First one is streaked shear water, which is again a pale white and brownish bird. In the center we have wet tail shear water and on the bottom right corner we have a short tail shear water. So all these three are not as common as the other two, uh, especially the wet tailed and short tail shear water records are very small in number. And uh, if you see uh, the wet tail shear water, so this image was taken from the trip where we saw it first again, it is in 2011. And this also is a memorable trip because uh, it was done just before monsoon. So we did this trip uh, by end of May and the monsoon was about to come. So the sea was a little bit rough. And so when we wanted to do a pelagic, there were not enough takers. So it's a tough time to go into the sea. So finally, we only had four, four of us who were ready to go at that time. And till that point of time, we had only seen flesh footed shear waters, bridal turn, a few Arctic skuas, and uh, Persian shear water. So we said that this is the time before monsoon is the time. We have to take a risk and we have to see something. We have to go out there and see what is different at this point of time. Is there any new bird? Let's just check it out. So, me, Mike, Praveen, Jay, and Praveen, yes, I think we went out during that weekend. And in that trip, we managed to get this two new birds for our pelagic trips. So we also saw a Wilson storm petrel and we also got this uh, wet tail shear water. So it was a really interesting trip where we had only four people on a boat, uh, four of a people in a, on a boat and we just we were just watching flocks of birds all around us. So the other set of birds uh, or uh, pelagic special birds are petrels and storm petrels. So the first bird here is uh, Jovanin's petrel, which is again uh, a special uh, bird in the sense that it is not that common bird. It was one of the recently described bird uh, and it uh, breeds in the Persian Gulf area and it winters, it spreads ac across the Arabian Sea and further down in the Indian Ocean. So this was uh, seen in a, a trip, a 2011 trip where we actually went for an overnight uh, pelagic trip which means we went out on a Saturday morning and then we came back on, a, on the next day, that Sunday evening. 
So we traveled around 80 kilometers away into the sea. And this bird was seen at around that distance. So that was an amazing uh, experience for us to see this bird, which is not really seen very near to the coast till that point of time. But after that, there have been few records where it is, uh, it, uh, it was observed a little bit near to the coast as well. The other two birds are Wilson storm petrel on the, in the bottom and Swinhoe storm petrel on the right. So if you see those birds in inset are, are the possibly the one first images of those uh, birds. The first, uh, the Wilson storm petrel, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, along with the wet still shear water, we saw the Wilson storm petrel also in the same trip. Uh, and interestingly, Wilson storm petrel is one of the widely spread birds uh, in the world. So I'll come to that uh, in, shortly. And the other one is a Swinhoe storm petrel, which is uh, an all dark bird. And luckily we actually got the first sighting uh, at, at a point where both Wilson storm petrel and Swinhoe storm petrels were there. So that is the image that you can see on the top corner that was by Vivek. And this helped us to easily say that, yeah, this is a different bird and this is uh, relatively, the size is slightly larger than Wilson storm petrel. Yeah, so this looks like a Swinhoe storm petrel. So if you look at uh, these birds, uh, there are a few small interesting characters. So especially if you go back and see this uh, uh, close up images of some of these birds, you can see that they have, their beak has a unique structure. They have a tube on top of their beak uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there is a structure at the base of the beak above the beak. So that is a, uh, a, a tube through which actually these birds secrete their uh, extra salt from their body. So since they drink sal saline water, sea water, they have to secrete this extra salt out. And these are the tubes through which uh, they push that uh, extra salt out. So they, they have a salt gland to separate out the salt and then these are pushed through uh, these uh, tubes. And because they have this tubular structure on top of their beak, these birds, shearwaters, petrels, and storm petrels are also called uh, tube noses. So therefore, that group of birds are called uh, tube noses. So even big birds like albatrosses also have this. So they are all part of the same group called tube noses. The other interesting thing that I want to just mention at this point of time is about the migration aspect of these birds. Uh, Earlier, Mike had given a talk, talk on migration, and he mostly covered examples of birds breeding in the northern latitudes and migrating south in the winter. Interestingly, many pelagic birds that we see in the Indian Ocean, uh, Indian coast here, uh, have a different behavior. For example, the birds like this flush-footed shearwater, or uh, wet-tailed shearwater, or sh short-tailed shearwater, or even Wilson storm petrel that we see in the next slide. They are all southern hemisphere breeders. So they breed in areas like Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, islands uh, near those areas and sub-Antarctic sub islands. And they then spend the Southern Hemisphere winter, which is actually our summer here. So that is why they are seen here during the monsoon time. So they migrate north from their Southern breeding grounds and they come to our coast. And then there are other uh, interesting birds like uh, uh, a Persian shearwater or Joannes petrel, which actually breeds in the Persian Gulf and then migrates south. So this is more of a similar story. But then there is this lateral migration, which is also interesting. The birds like streaked shearwater or uh, Swinhoe storm petrel, they breed in the Pacific near uh, islands, uh, uh, the islands near Japan and Korea and that area. And then they dis uh, distribute, they actually disperse. Uh, in the Indian Ocean. So they move, you can say, say, say that they, they are moving from east to west. So from Japan coast, they actually come and uh, winter in the uh, Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. So the, you see a different uh, type of migration pattern here for these birds. So this is interesting because normally we always uh, consider migration as a north-south movement and mostly all our migrants come from the Eurasian region. So this is an interesting uh, observation. Next set of birds, uh, uh, the pelagic birds uh, group is booby. There are three boobies which are uh, recorded in Indian list, but we have seen only one of them in the pelagic trips. So that is this mass booby. So this is again from the first trip that we had in 2010. So we got two individuals. One on the left is a immature a young uh, booby. It has an all dark 
uh, neck and the second one is a near adult mass booby. So the image of mass booby by Raju, which was put out in the uh, slide uh, by Nikhil. So that is another image which caught attention of a lot of people and generated interested, interest in pelagic birds. The, an another set of birds which are very similar to the inland terns are the pelagic terns. So interestingly, the pelagic terns are more dark, so they, they, we can categorize them as dark terns. So there are two common, uh, common uh, dark terns that we see in uh, pelagic trips. One is a bridal tern, which is on the left, and the sooty tern, which is on the right. So if you look at them uh, in their adult plumage, they, are, they have some similarities, but in uh, their juvenile immature plumages, you can see they are poles apart. Uh, bridal is a very pale bird, and on the right, you have the sooty juvenile, which is almost an all dark bird. So these uh, birds, uh, again, are one of the commonest group. And uh, among this, the bridal tern is one of the commonest birds that we see during pelagic trips. Sooty tern is a little bit more rare in pelagic trips, but, uh, but we have records and it also breeds in the lecture deep. And a very related family to terns is nodies. So, there are again few species of nodis uh, in the list, in the checklist in of India, but uh, there are two. Only two nodis have been recorded. Uh, two of them have been recorded in the pelagic trip. So first one is a lesser nodi. So that was recorded uh, from Kanyakumari, and on the right is a brown nodi, which has been recorded from multiple places. So brown nodi also breeds in Lakshadweep. So it's a little bit more relatively commoner bird compared to the lesser nodi. And the trip where the lesser nodi was recorded was again somewhat memorable because we started our trip uh, on a, uh, when the weather was okay, on an okay day, you can tell that. And as we progressed in the trip, the weather became bad and then it really became uh, choppy. So we decided to return back and while returning, the waves were from the coming from our left side and waves and the wind was blowing from the left side because of which the boat was rocking left and right. So if you're standing on one side of the boat, at one point you'll be looking, staring directly into the water down below because the boat will be slanted towards your side. And a few seconds later, you would be actually looking at the sky open sky with nothing. You won't see anything else. You'll be looking at an open sky. And then this will alternate. So every other second, you will either be looking directly into the water or into the sky. So that was an interesting experience. And during that choppy weather, uh, we actually saw uh, a lot of turns and among them was this one single lesser nodi. The other two groups of birds, uh, which have one represented each uh, in the pelagic trip is uh, tropic birds and frigate birds. So in both these cases, there are three species which are there in the Indian list, but uh, we have recorded only one species of bird. So there are a few trips uh, in uh, from the Western coast where we have recorded red-billed tropic bird. And it is relatively a late entry into the pelagic trip uh, list. So we were always wondering where are the tropic birds, where are the frigate birds, but we never used to see them uh, from 2010 to at least five, six uh, years in different trips, we never managed to see a single tropic bird. And then uh, two, three years before we suddenly got uh, three, four sightings of uh, tropic birds in various trips. And suddenly uh, this bird became a little bit more common than we actually thought it to be. And same is the case with frigate birds. Though there are a lot of records of frigate birds which are wind blown, and also people who are watching the coast on a windy day, like a monsoon time, etc., have seen frigate birds flying above them. But un uh, interestingly, they have uh, not been sighted in most of the pelagic trips. So I think there are only one or two, one trip is what I remember where we have actually seen a frigate bird during a pelagic trip. So somehow it's interesting to see that some of these birds are common if we go out uh, into the sea 
and some of these birds are not. So there is uh, some uh, speci specialization that is happening there between these birds as well in terms of habitat and distance from the shore, I think. And though these birds are not recorded in uh, any of the pelagic trips, we are sure that they are there because uh, a lot of birds do get wind blown. So it will be interesting to see how we can see these birds in pelagic trips. Another set of birds uh, which actually captured my uh, attention was skuas or Jaegers. So Jaegers are three species of skuas in the, in the skua family, which are small. So these are the three small uh, representatives of uh, that group. So they are called Jaegers uh, in some, by some authors and some others still call them skua. And then there are two, so a few big uh, skuas as well. So they are, they are always called uh, skuas in by all authors. So these Jaegers uh, were, are interesting in multiple aspects. So one of the most spectacular sight in a pelagic trip is a Jaeger uh, skua chasing another bird. So basically these birds, skuas, are uh, the pirates of the sea. So like pirates of the Caribbean, we have the pirates of our seas are these uh, skuas. Their main way of, or one of the key way of getting food is by chasing the other birds which has just caught food or got food and make them to regurgitate the food and then take it. So when they see a recently fed tern or gull, they start their chase and they chase these birds till they drop their food. And then these birds actually take that feed and then go away. So some of these chases can last for uh, one or two minutes or one or two minutes. And when this Arctic skua chases a turn or a girl, uh, the maneuvers are amazing. So there are some videos out there. You can actually see how they manage this feat. So this is uh, one of the uh, memorable side scenes from a, a pelagic trip. And once you see this, you will really get attracted to these birds. And the other thing you can notice here is that there is a huge amount of variation in the plumage, in their plumage. So their plumage uh, is somewhat uniform when they are in their breeding grounds, that is in the Eurasia. So these squas and Jaegers, uh, these Jaegers actually breed in the Northern uh, Hemisphere at, uh, near to the pole and uh, North side of Asia and Europe. And their uh, breeding plumage is somewhat uniform. Basically all the birds uh, have the same similar uniform. They have morphs, but uh, you cannot distinguish much between the birds. But once they come to their wintering grounds, their plumage uh, undergoes a change and their winter plumage or basic plumage is so variable that every skua that you see can be individually distinguished. So no two skua generally look alike after a period, say around November, you can actually go to a trip and actually come back and look at your images and count the number of individuals. So every individual will be generally different from the, uh, from the other individual. So that is quite interesting. And this plumage variation is amazing. And this is, uh, this is one of the challenging aspect uh, in school identification as well. So these are the different, uh, some of the examples of the plumage variation in Arctic skua. Similarly, there is another species which is slightly larger in size and bulkier. So this is Pomeranian skua. And if you look at this plumage, uh, you, you can see that it is somewhat similar to the Arctic skua plumages again. So uh, you can see uh, they have different morphs. So you have a dark morph uh, Pomeranian uh, or somewhat dark morph Pomeranian Jaeger here on the top corner. And then there are uh, other regular birds. The brood, breeding plumage, you can see that they have uh, a very nicely shaped central tail feather. So it's almost like a spoon shape. So you can see on the bird on the right most corner on the bottom or this side, you can see that they have a very broad spoon shaped uh, central tail feather. So this is a unique uh, identifier for Pomeranian Jaeger. But in winter, most of the time, this uh, tail will be under mount and you may not be able to use this, uh, see this feature. Among Jaegers, uh, smaller skuas, uh, the smallest one is long-tailed skua or long-tailed Jaeger. So this is also the cutest out of it. So if you look at a 
if we compare their images, you will uh, typically feel that long tailed skua is a cute bird, while a Pomeranian skua is a really like a villain. You can see that face expression is completely different, and Arctic is somewhere in the middle. Again, these birds also exhibit uh, quite a wide range of plumages, and they are again similar in their wintering plumage to the other Jaegers. And structurally, they are slightly different, but otherwise, they also can create confusions. In among skuas, uh, there is another group which are large skuas. So these are slightly different uh, in the sense uh, they are also southern breeders. So they breed in southern uh, hemisphere. They are not uh, northern breeders like the Jaegers. So there are two species that at least we have encountered. One is a south polar skua and the other one is a brown skua. So south polar is on the left side, the pale bird, and the other one is a brown skua. So again, the, here we have a lot of uh, confusions because uh, the South Polar Skua has a dark morph and brown, which is very similar to the brown Skua. And so uh, challenge, uh, it is uh, in challenging to actually identify these species. And sometimes we will never get a con conclusion. For example, the bird on the right uh, was seen from a pelagic trip uh, from Chennai, organized by Subu. And we had got enough good shots of this bird. And this was circulated among experts uh, in uh, skuas and at the end of the whole discussion the decision was that this is most probably a brown skua 90 percent we are sure but nobody is ready to actually say 100 percent that this is a brown skua so that uh, so much is a confusion uh, in this species that even experts won't really vouch for an identity okay so to summarize uh, this is a list of pelagic birds that we have in Indian checklist. So we have around uh, seven uh, shear waters out of which around five we saw. And then there are a few rare birds like tropical and kori shear water, which are uh, mostly known only from specimens. Uh, storm petrels, we, we have Wilson's and Swinhoes as a common ones and others are historical records. Similarly, same case for petrel barrows. Petrel is a historical record among boobies, frigate birds, and tropic birds. Uh, we have few species that we are not recorded in pelagic trips. In terms of terns and nodies, black nodies is the one which we have not uh, really recorded in the pelagic trip. And all the skuas we have uh, recorded in the trips. So that we have a roughly around 32 species of pelagic birds. And as you can see here, a good amount of them have been seen in the different pelagic trips that has happened across the various skuas. So now uh, you would think that it is just about bird, but no, pelagic trip is also exciting because it gives us opportunity to see some other unique life forms as well. So we have uh, seen plenty of dolphins in various trips. There have been say, multiple sightings of sea snakes and different fishes like flying fish, jellyfish uh, have been seen various turtles, different species of turtles. And one of the biggest uh, sighting has been, recent sighting was about a whale shark from Mangalore, which is again an amazing sighting. And uh, some of the other trips like uh, taken, taken by Abhishek, Jamalabad, etc., had uh, seen whales as well. So there is quite a good amount of uh, uh, variety in animal species as well other animal species, other things than birds out there as well. So this is also sometimes interesting. And in some of the trips, this will be the ones which will actually uh, give you some solace because you would not have seen much birds in a trip, but a set of dolphins will compensate for that. For example, the image of this uh, jumping dolphin, it's a pantropical spotted uh, dolphin. So this was another uh, memorable experience where we had uh, started from Chennai coast and around 15, 20, I think 20, 20 or 30 kilometers from the coast, we suddenly were surrounded by hundreds and thousands of dolphins actually. At the, thousand, the number thousand came much later, but at any point of time, we could see all around dolphins and they were jumping uh, out of the water like this and they were just moving across. This was more like a, a, a big procession of dolphins going across. And this uh, lasted around uh, 30, 
30 to 40 minutes, I think. And if you take account overall, there will be thousands of dol uh, dolphins that would have passed us. And later we came to know that this is called a super pod of dolphins where they join in a group and then they move. So uh, these are some of the things, uh, other things, other than birds that uh, we have encountered during the pelagic trips, but not all is well. Sometimes we also have to see the other side of life. So sometimes we will see carcasses. It may be natural or it may be caused by man, we don't know. Sometimes we see dead animals being floating in the sea. Then of course, uh, one of the major issues that we have is the issue of plastic pollution. You can see a bridal turn sitting on a junk bag full of plastic. So this is uh, one of the common litter that we see across in the seas, various places. And this is uh, a tough situation because this, uh, pl these plastics take a long time to disintegrate. So this is going to be there in the sea forever. The only positive side of it is that yeah, it provides a perch for uh, the sterns or skuas, but unfortunately, this is a sad state. Another uh, aspect which is detrimental to the birds is uh, fishing practices. So here you can see a skua, which is a, a Pomeranian skua, which is which has got stuck in a long line. So long line fishing uses this long lines uh, hook with a hook at the end and sometimes this uh, birds accidentally get uh, hooked onto that and then that could cause uh, even death of these birds. Okay, in summary, what would we say about pelagic birding? It is an awesome and unique experience. And to support that, I can give you a few arguments. It is the trip where it is a trip where you will get rare models in great perches like this uh, turn. So you can actually have amazing photos after you go for a pelagic trip and you will get a completely different experience. You will get rare birds. You will see those birds uh, in environment which you uh, never would have uh, imagined. And the birding there is relaxed. So now you can see some of the famous birders again relaxing while birding and don't uh, uh, don't forget to see that uh, that bird guy who is uh, sitting or uh, resting with a book even while sleeping so now you know why he is so knowledgeable and how he has managed to know so much in such a short time even during sleep he doesn't leave his book and his gps is also with him so he's ready for birding so you can actually bird like this, you can relax. And when you see a bird, you then you immediately take, come back, spring to life and then see the bird and then go back and rest. So this is one of the best way to bird, right? And another good thing and unique thing about pelagic compared to traditional birding is that you don't really follow those rules in birding that you generally have to follow. So you can dress in whichever color you want. There is no question of bright colors, green, camouflage, nothing. You can go like this in this image where you can put orange life jackets and then just go around and see bird. No bird, bird is bothered whether you are wearing green or whether we are wearing orange. The styling is up to you. So no dress code. And as you see here, you can shout, you can say hi, you can say whatever you want. And no one will say shh, because here you don't really worry too much about all those uh, general rules that we have in birding. So that way you're free. It is, it's one of the most enjoyable way to bird and to top it, you have food. And that too, fresh food. As we mentioned earlier, most of the trips, uh, in most of the trips, we get fresh, freshly caught fish and the boat guys are generally generous enough to cook this fresh fish immediately from the boat itself. And the taste that you get when eating from a boat, the freshly cooked fish is amazing. So this is something that uh, yeah you cannot experience anywhere outside. So yeah, in all in all total uh, in some total, it's an amazing and awesome experience. So what is the end result at the end of this trip? So generally, you see a bunch of birders who are tired, 
who has been drained out but look at their faces all of them are smiling they are uh, from 180 degree smile you can say they are so happy they have seen some birds which they would never see otherwise so the hardship is really worth it and the other side is that all this uh, information that we have collected during these trips have been uh, formally published mostly uh, mostly in indian birds so you have uh, quite a good number of articles there in indian birds which summarizes most of these trips and ashish has been has been kind enough to actually uh, create a special issue for pelagic birds so this is that volume 7 number 5 number 3 which is a special issue on pelagic birds which contains quite a lot of information about pelagic birds and indian birds not only has information about the pelagic trips that we have done but other uh, information uh, pelagic information like uh, even information from areas like chagos and Ma sri lanka etc are also in involved uh, included there so you get a, a holistic view of the pelagic experience from these uh, articles and these trips would not have been possible without the support of, uh, from various organizers. So a lot of people have uh, helped in doing these trips. So I have to mention few like Praveen, Jay, Shiva, Jafar, Yes Praveen, Jinesh, Subramanian Shankar, Pranay, Mandar, etc. A lot of people, uh, I, maybe I, some of them are here in this group, I am assuming. And there are many others who also have helped. If I forget their names, please forgive. But all these people help to organize a lot of these trips and there, then also these organizations like Goa Birders, Natural History Societies in Kerala like MNHS, CNHS, KNS, etc. also lend their support for doing these trips. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the government organizations like Fisheries Department, Coastal Police, uh, Forest Department, Port Authorities, etc. also gave uh, their consent and cooperation to do these trips so really it was a really a group effort with from so many people that we could actually do a lot of trips across the course and we could get so much of information and before uh, concluding i just want to mention about photographers once again because normally once a trip is over most of the photos in a card sd card or whatever cf card goes into a black hole and never again see the light of the day. But in case of Pelagic, it's really interesting. Most, we actually collaborated so much that most of these photographers shared their full set of images, sometimes even raw images, wholeheartedly with the, the organizers. So that actually we can revisit them as and when we had a query or found out something. So I don't think this happens very often. So most of this uh, work has been possible with the support from photographers and bird watchers who dedicatedly uh, put their lives at risk and actually came aboard uh, a boat to actually look for these uh, birds. And many experts also helped us in identifying of these birds and that has increased our knowledge. So thanks to them as well. And finally, I thank Nick and Delhi Birders for this opportunity and Shashank for his support. So hopefully few of, of, a few of you has, have got inspired with this and will make few pelagic trips in the future. And with that hope, I'm saying bye. Thank you. Thanks, Ripu, for uh, excellent presentation. Um, like, uh, before I take questions, like, I just want to like, say a couple of things. Like what Deepu, Praveen, Jafar, they, what they did during pelagic trips in 2010 was complete game changer for birding in India when it comes to pelagics. And I would say over the year, like when the Kerala, as, as, as Deepu mentioned, the Kerala Fisheries Department helped and then it just like it went everywhere on the East and West Coast afterwards. But uh, I would still say Deepu was being quite modest. If you get chance, then try and read his paper on skuas uh, and their plumages and it's excellent like it's one of the best work of skuas across world so uh, it's uh, so that, that i think that paper is published in indian birds and um, it's the best work when it comes to skuas so uh, let me get to the questions deepu for you I uh, so yeah okay, sorry uh, we've opened the chat box for questions so if anybody has any questions for deepu they can start typing them in Great. i think we've already started getting a few questions 
while the questions come shashank we have a couple of announcements to make so i can just make sure. them quickly and no then problem. we can go ahead with the question and answers yes great give me one second great so as part of our announcements tomorrow we have a talk waders for dummies by martin kelsey so martin had taken a talk earlier on wobblers for dummies which was very informative and now he's doing one session on waders which is tomorrow 5 pm using the same zoom meeting link as today the second announcement is there is a quiz being organized for young birders by early bird it's called are you a wise quacker part 2 uh, for this there's got to be a registration link which misha will be posting in the chat box right now so anybody who's interested in participating in this quiz can use that registration link the quiz is being held on sunday 5th of july at 11 am and the last announcement is the question of the day so our partner zais uh, has a competition running for all of these talks so basically after every talk there is one question that's asked you have to go to delibirdfoundation.org/contest to answer this question and you have a choice of winning either a zais binocular harness or a zais cleaning kit so the question for today's talk is which is the pelagic bird that has been recorded from ladakh and when was it recorded if you'd like you can take a screenshot or a photograph of this page so that you know what the question is and where you can submit your answers the answers will be forwarded to deepu who will be selecting the best answer and that person will be selected to get the prize with that i'll hand it over to shashank to lead the question and answer session thanks kavi okay so deepu the first question for you is uh, how do these birds rest or sleep on the sea okay uh, so they are naturally adapted for a life in sea so they are similar to ducks in that aspect that they have a webbed feet so they can rest on the sea and they can uh, swim as well so uh, i would say they are naturally uh, adapted to a life in sea and a good amount of time is spent in flying and uh, some amount of time is also spent in uh, resting on the water so but uh, most of these birds fly quite a lot and they can actually fly without spending uh, much of energy for a very similar to the energy amount of energy that they spend while sitting so they have uh, unique adaptations uh, to make sure that uh, they can live in the sea so they are, for example their feathers are also much more rough than a bird which is uh, in the land so that they can uh, withstand this uh, heavy wind and the splashes in the water correct So next question is: uh, Have you recorded any tag, tagged pelagic birds during your trips? No. Uh, interestingly, we have not really recorded any tagged birds till now. So it's uh, mostly the normal birds. But we know that there have been a lot of uh, tagging as well as uh, uh, you say geolocator mm -hmm. fitted birds uh, are there out. But uh, till now, we have not found any. the next one for you is what are the options when a storm happens and you are 8200 kilometers away from the seashore the best thing <laughs> best thing that you can do is not to make it happen let it happen right so knowingly you will never do that and as you as you know uh, we have a fairly uh, accurate warning system so if you have a storm uh, we won't even make a trip so or you uh, get better pelagics <laughs> of course i would love to be there in that see yes. but unfortunately boatmen will say no chance we are not going going out so <laughs> it would is it would be good to be there but yeah it never happens okay one more question is why aren't there enough sightings of pelagic birds in andaman nicobar even during the ship journey by ship to nicobar from port blair we have not spotted any uh that's uh, something interesting uh, uh, roughly uh, i don't know how much accurate this is because we don't really have enough data we have just right. done few uh pelagic trips which are more uh, you can say not so organized in terms of methodology and all mm -hmm. but in uh from whatever we know the density of birds on the west coast is much higher than the density of birds in the east coast for many species 
So overall, we have seen that uh, the number in the Bay of Bengal is not that high uh, compared mm -hmm. to that in the Arabian Sea. So this is one possible reason. And the other thing is about pr primary productivity. The whole bird movement in the sea depends on the productivity uh, that is happening. And unlike land where the productivity areas are fixed, for example, you know that this is a forest where uh, this is the type of food, this is a habitat, etc. It's, it's, it's static. But right. in sea, this area of productivity keeps moving. So at some point of time, this is a, will be the area where there is a fish, there is productivity happening and then fish congregate and birds congregate and other higher level predators con con congregate. So, and a uh, few hours later, it will be maybe somewhere else. Few days later, it will be completely in a different area. So this uh, changes. And the main key factor affecting uh, de that determines the presence is the productivity. Maybe there is a productivity in the Andaman area is not that what is uh, expected for uh, birds uh, mm -hmm. or uh, whatever prey that they are actually looking for. So possibly that could be the reason why they are not there. But I think there are birds uh, sighted from Bay of Bengal. It doesn't mean that they are not there. Uh, in uh, various trips, we have enough uh, records of different birds. And then the other part is your luck. So sometimes uh, sighting a pelagic bird is luck. As I said, they move around based on the productivity. So it is not that just because there is sea, you will see it. Uh, you have to be at that place where the productivity is happening. Right. Dibu, I'll just add like a couple of things here. So like, for example, I have been to Narkondam Island a couple of times. And the first trip I did was in March and uh, I hardly got to see any pelagics that time. But when I did a trip in October and it was full of pelagic birds, like I got sleek shear water, flesh footed shear water, um, wedge tail shear water, white tail tropic bird, uh, then there was a, so, so there were lots of pelagics which were sighted in the second trip, like along with, along with lots of turns. Uh, so I think it just, as you said, like it all depends on what happens on that particular day and uh, lots of other factors as well. So, yeah. Um, then the next question is, okay. So the pelagic birds seems to have some funny names like booby, naughty, etc. Do these means anything or do they come from uh, surfing men's language or a great present? Uh, that's it. So do you have any? Not, <laughs> not sure about that, but uh, yeah, some of them have also some funny behavior. So possibly names could have come from them, but, uh, and some of the birds do really have some uh, connection with, uh, uh, with our beliefs and uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. For example, the word petrel is uh, believed to have come from St. Peter walking over water. So the, wow. okay. the that uh, bi biblical story, uh, because this uh, storm petrels have this habit of pattering on top of water and uh, feeding. So this almost looks like they are walking on top of water. So there are some cases like this where the names come from the mythology or, or history or whatever, but some names I think would have come from somebody's imagination as well. So I don't have a fixed answer there. Okay, so the next one is what about what about timing of pelagics and tentatively how it may uh, how much it may cost? Yeah, so uh, quickly to tell the, uh, the it depends on what birds you are targeting. For example, the southern breeders, as I mentioned, visit our area during their uh, winter. That is our summer. So around uh, from May to uh, October is a time when actually you can see a lot of those southern breeders like St Wilson Storm Petrel or Flush Footed Shearwater or uh, Short Tail Shearwater, etc. Uh, while or the northern breeders like squaws actually come uh, for uh, as winter visitors here. So to see them, you actually start seeing them around September, October, and they stay till here till May, April, May. So it depends on the bird species. So there is no fixed timing, but generally we say that around September, October is a good time because that could actually be the intersection point for both Southern and Northern breeders. So that is possibly a good time, you can say. And then April, May, again, the other uh, point of intersection. In terms of costing, it depends on the boat cost. Uh, so there is no fixed answer there. It depends on the size of the boat, uh, the time and season. For example, if there is a lot of fish catch available, the boat guys will not even come. Even if you offer them a lack, they, won't, they, won't come, they may not come. But when they have nothing else to do, it may be easy for us to pull them into such trips. So there again, it depends on the scenario. Okay, so next one is, uh, where do pelagic birds nest or lay eggs? Okay, so that's interesting. So I didn't uh, mention that in the presentation. 
almost all of these pelagic birds uh, breed on uninhabited islands there are few cases where they actually uh, breed on the mainland but most of the breeding happens on uninhabited islands uh, for example even the nearest uh, uh, place for us uh, would be uh, where a lot of breeding happens would be lakshadweep uh, where pity island is very no well known place for uh, nodies and uh, sooty tern breeding so like that they choose in, a, in uninhabited islands uh, for breeding and these birds have uh, 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 an uncanny ability to actually get back to that uh, breeding island even after they travel uh, thousands of miles they can come back to the same island for breeding so they have that uh, affinity to that their original breeding place correct so the next question i think you somewhat answered it already but i'll still repeat like in which uh, in india which part of coastal area have more rich with pelagic birds east or west so i would say actually the south is i would say the best because the more uh, you go south the more chances are that you get a lot more indian ocean species uh, also into the mix for example sri lanka is uh, has much more uh, species recorded uh, than india actually in that sense because that is at the tip and you can get both uh, you can say eastern birds and western birds from the indian ocean perspective so uh, but within the east and west i would say to with whatever we know today arabian sea is slightly better right a uh, very important question now is there any medicine to avoid sea sickness <laughs> <laughs> okay this we were discussing a little bit before i don't think there is any uh, very proven medicine which can avoid that but there are mechanisms which a lot of people have tried out and many people have got benefits there are some tab tablets Uh, like abomin uh, there are uh, home remedies like ginger uh, and then there are some patches which are uh, also there which you can put shoulder patches type of stuff like an uh, nicotine patch or whatever which you can uh, put on your body and maybe that helps but i don't know whether there is a 100% full proof solution all right um, what do you have to say about the recent pelagic bird insurgence inland after cyclone um, amfan i think that is quite expected yeah. any cyclone uh, uh, this birds actually get caught in the eye of the cyclone uh, right. and since the wind around that eye is very fast they cannot actually get out of the eye it is like if you know the our mythology it's like apimanyu getting trapped inside the in the kurukshetra battle something like that so they just caught, get caught and then the cyclone hits the land and then it dissipates that is when this eye breaks and uh, they can actually go uh, free so that is the time when they move back to the sea from the land wherever they were they had landed and that is when you see these uh, cyclone hit birds so anywhere you have a cyclone there is a good chance that uh, pelagic birds could have got carried away in that and there is a good chance that you can see them immediately after the cyclone uh, then the recently on the west coast we actually got one of the uh, red billed tropic bird all the way in eastern maharashtra on one yeah. of the uh, inland inland water bodies yeah so they may take a day or two of rest because if they have really got uh, caught up in that wind sometimes they stay for one or two days and then they again depart back to the sea if they are healthy okay the next one is why is that we don't see so many birds during a cruise travel okay there could be multiple reasons it uh, depends on the uh, cruise Uh, ship itself so the bigger the ship is it is uh, difficult it is to actually s sometimes detect those uh, birds smaller birds mm -hmm. uh, yeah and the other thing is that you may not be uh, i don't know how much view you will get in a boat you actually can get almost a 360 degree or 270 mm -hmm. degree view from a point where you are standing in front of the boat so you have much better view but in a bigger ship you are just your uh, angle of view is uh, field of view is restricted Uh, this could be possible few of the possible reasons but sometimes i think you, it, it is it is again a chance of luck uh, luck a big uh, luck factor is there mm -hmm. if you are passing a flock of birds which are uh, an area of good productivity and there is a flock of bird there is a good chance that you get them and uh, the fact that uh, pelagic birds uh, are associated with fishing industry is a well known fact so if you are big fishing trawlers uh, actually attract the uh, pelagic birds when they draw the nets because that is where the bycatch or the there will be fishes which are jumping out of the net which are small fishes and sometimes the fishermen also put their secondary uh, catch uh, yeah. waste outside so sometimes bird come to the ship attracted to that or trawlers uh, attracted by this uh, offering so it is not that you don't get to see them uh, but uh, again it depends on uh, what is exact situation right 
The next one is very important question again. How are the bird record from such pelagic trips can be uploaded on eBird? So, uh, okay, interesting question. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. Uh, you, you can always do the standard way you do in uh, eBird. Uh, you can just get your location, just put the bird and uh, upload it. So that is always a normal way. But uh, because Pelagic is a slightly different uh, environment, you don't really see too many birds. You don't really see um, big numbers uh, most of the time. So generally what we have done in our trips is to devise a specific methodology where we have uh, divided our uh, Arabian Sea or uh, the Bay of Bengal as into a square grid, like a 0.1 into 0.1 uh, degree grid. And whatever birds we see in that one point, we, we make it as a hotspot. And then whatever we birds we see, we just record against that hotspot. So, and this list are generally uh, slightly longer, we generally don't take 15 minutes list because in 15 minutes you may not get any bird at all. That's a standard uh, operating procedure like short time, li short period list is what eBird recommends. But in Pelagic, we make a slightly bigger list. But basically we try to align to a hotspot and try to record the bird. So that uh, is done uh, by a script. So there's a Python script which is, which is available uh, 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 free, uh, publicly. So we use that uh, script to actually generate this data out of uh, our recorded list. So we, while going, we just record the uh, list of birds and the time and the mm -hmm. number. And then uh, we also record the GPS coordinate using uh, one of the popular available app in Android. And right. at home, we just run a script and it generates uh, maybe 10 or 20 or whatever number of lists corresponding to our trip. And then we just bulk upload it using the Excel. So Great. that is what we have done to put our data, but it is uh, it is just a way. Another way is just to record as you go normal. Okay, now very important. Another important question. It's about all about twitching. So is the bird taxonomy like pelagic bird taxonomy constantly changing like the land birds? Oh yeah, it is. It is. I would say it is. It is even yeah, yeah very very fluctuating and dynamic, uh, okay. especially because uh, these uh, there is a um, even more. Uh, Interesting fact there for uh, these uh, pelagic birds because uh, in land at least these birds have a bigger range and there is a uh, wide distribution uh, and there is a chance of uh, interbreed uh, like the if it's a continuous range your chance of g bird getting diverse uh, diversified into multiple species is less mm -hmm. but in case of pelagic birds as I mentioned they breed in this uninhabited islands and they have this affiliation to their uh, uh, natal uh, uh, breeding island. So one, a set of birds in island generally always return back to that, which means they are almost getting isolated from a uh, same birds, uh, same species population, which is maybe 100 kilometers or 200 miles away. So these very uh, rarely have uh, exchanges, gene exchanges. So over a period of time, there is a possibility that two populations can diverge enough to become species. So these right. are very tough to detect by plumage characters because the plumage characters are very minimal. But mm -hmm. from a DNA analysis, I think a lot of species are getting created. Uh, so in pelagic birds, it's, it's very, very dynamic. So there are quite a lot of uh, splits uh, happening there in that area. Right. Okay. The next one is, what are the breeding months in the islands like Lakshadweep? Generally, it's the summer uh, is a breeding time. So everywhere, uh, so it, it is roughly corresponding to that. But uh, yeah, it again, there is a variation. So the more northern latitude, uh, and in the northern latitude, the more north you go or more south you go, the seasonal uh, breeding is more prominent. But along the equator, the, the weather and climate and the situation generally remains the same across the year. So there is year-round breeding happening in islands which are around the equator. So again, it depends. Okay. Uh, the next one is, what are the preparators for pelagic birds? Okay. So there is a chain within pelagic birds where they uh, uh, there is uh, this hierarchy. But normally, they spread it. Uh, birds do not eat other birds. Very rarely uh, that is noticed. Mostly they feed on carcasses, but not on live birds. Uh, but in terms of uh, predation, the threat is actually from the bottom. So right. when they are uh, swimming, uh, the bigger fishes or sharks could actually catch these birds uh, which are swimming. And in uh, flight, I think possibility is that they, there are other predatory birds and uh, like uh, 
falcon uh, for those bigger uh, eagles uh, and uh, uh, falcons if really they are there or there this but this is rare right because they may not be inside the sea but normally it is from the bottom of the sea that they have uh, more threat right i guess that's more or less i think all the questions which were there for a the talk um so with this i would like to conclude a talk excellent talk deepu i'd like a lot to learn from this talk as well and uh, i guess very soon we'll we'll see each other and i think but tomorrow sure. in the talk so so yeah, yeah we'll, sure and hopefully we'll catch up very soon again yeah. thanks everyone bye thank for you yeah bye